We are going to be focusing on the Quran, uh, the Quran on religious pluralism. Sheikh Hassan Talib, assalamu alaikum and welcome. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and to the beautiful listeners of uh, 786. Apparently we're in for another fascinating journey as we're going to traverse religious pluralism. Inshallah. What do we what do we mean when we speak about the pluralism, uh, Sheikh Hassan? All right. So uh, first and foremost, uh, Jihadija, I think um, it is a very important for us to understand that from the Islamic vantage point forever and within any kind of, any kind of context which, which we find ourselves and our relation to the Qur'an, is that the Qur'an, of course, wants to be understood uh, contextually. The Qur'an wants to be relevant to people's lives, right? And so whilst there are ways of reading the Qur'an from saying that we will uh, go to the Qur'an and derive meanings from it exclusively, um, you know, to the extent that the Qur'an reveals meanings to us, we also want to, given our lived experiences and our lived realities, go to the Qur'an and find out what the Qur'an has to say about what we live and how um, things evolve on the ground. So. In a particular sense, this notion of uh, religious pluralism, of course, is uh, a relatively sort of new uh, concept in a sense uh, or a terminology, right? And so it, it does engender and uh, throw up quite a bit of confusion in mm -hmm. people's minds. What do we mean when you speak about religious pluralism? And there is um, good uh, a basis for the fact that they somehow um, you know emerges confusion around this because uh, the term has in fact been you know utilized um, with with uh, different intentions and different in uh, sort of intended meanings uh, by different people and so when we speak about um, uh, uh, rel religious pluralism in a South African context even uh, then we obviously thinking about the notion of this so-called rainbow nation. We're mm -hmm. thinking about this notion of us living uh, together as a uh, as a nation, having found freedom after uh, 1994 in terms of the political liberation of our country and the preceding eras of oppression and injustice and tyranny, uh, which of course, um, you know, in history. Um, has has occurred uh, in our country as it has also in many other countries. And so when we found ourselves um, in 1994, for example, with a constitution that promotes social cohesion, that promotes diversity, that promotes human dignity, for example, uh, then, of course, the notion of a pluralist society is, is what comes to mind. And so uh, in and amongst uh, all of that, the notion then also of the religious pluralism itself um, uh, 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 projects itself very, very uh, prominently. And so from our perspective, what we want to do, we want to be able to say, okay, uh, there are a number of notions of what the religious pluralism actually means, but we want to say, what does the Quran mean when it refers to religious pluralism, right? And uh, just a small caveat uh, in that regard, like many other modern phenomena, um, the term may not be used in the same way in the mm. Quran, mm. like this modern term. But does that mean that the concept is not in the Quran? Of course not. Mm. The concept may very well be embedded in the Quran as a foundational value, but not necessarily using the same terminology because right. these terminologies are current terminologies and so um, you know from just a uh, sort of academic traditional perspective we have very uh, 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 solid principles in this regard and that is that um, a, a, a particular maxim for example we say la mashahata fil musalahad there is no dispute pertaining to actual terminologies we are not interested in different how d terminologies Differ. We're interested in the concepts that they convey. And so um, those maxims, of course, and principles then serve as well in terms of also how we approach um, this particular. It's like the concept of human rights, for example. There's no yeah. such word in the Quran. 
Uh, but is that to say that the concept is absent? Of course mm-hmm. not. Um, the Quran is uh, fundamentally about the establishment of uh, justice, establishment of ethics, and uh, so human rights, uh, human dignity is right at the core of the message of Islam. Mm-hmm. Um, and so to come back then to the notion of religious pluralism, um, religious pluralism, uh, there are a few meanings out there which we would want to then refer to that um, we would want to say that's not what we mean yeah. when we speak about the religious pluralism. So, for example, uh, the notion of religious relativism, for example, is to say that uh, religion is a, a, an exclusive exclusively what people subjectively experience to be religion, what they believe to be religion. And so ultimately, therefore, uh, relativism, uh, that everybody's conceptualization of their own understanding Mm. of what religion is, is acceptable by everyone. And so therefore, everybody's, um, you know, uh, a path that they are on will ultimately lead to their truth. Yeah. So, of course, this is one extreme form (laughs) from our perspective, at least, from the Quranic perspective, at least. That's one extreme form of a conceptualization of what religious pluralism is. On the other maybe end and the other extreme of, 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 of that would be, um, uh, obviously, would be the notion of exclusivism. Mm. Uh, that uh, there's, there's no uh, absolute recognition whatsoever of the other and that uh, we explicitly, um, you know, um, uh, confine ourselves only to ourselves uh, in a very explicit way. And so, therefore, our conduct, therefore, our uh, interaction and therefore everything that we do uh, is colored, uh, is informed by that mindset. Clearly, this is not the Islamic approach to mm. things. Islam is about social cohesion. Islam is about um, lil alameen, compassion and mercy unto all of the worlds. And so to convey and also to um, manifest and represent this message of the Holy Quran, of course, uh, it's, about, um, it's about interaction with human society. So if we don't mean, um, there's maybe another few colors in between that we don't mean uh, about religious pluralism also. So we don't want to talk about um, uh, uh, theological truths when we talk about religious pluralism or salvation. Mm. And the Khadija, we don't want to talk, we're not talking about that when we are talking about the religious uh, pluralism, because indeed, uh, from the Islamic vantage point, uh, there is very clear, explicit text in the Holy Quran that this is Allah's final revelation unto humankind, and that those who reject this uh, revelation of Allah, they are disbelievers. So that is absolutely clear. Uh, so we are not venturing down the path of talking about religious pluralism and going into con- conversations and the purposes why we need, um, uh, you know, to have a, a, a sort of or rather understand clearly what religious pluralism is and how that is helpful to society by talking about how um, we we are exclusively Um, relating towards one another in terms of truth, in terms of um, uh, salvation and so forth. That is very, very clear. We are not compromising on that. That's not the area that we are talking about in terms of religious pluralism, right? So so I think that is very, very important for us to understand because our people, I think, sometimes um, become... Uh, confused about that. Mm. So the Quran is absolutely clear addressing the Prophet Sallallahu Qul inni Rasulullahi ilaykum jami' ya ayyuhan nas O humankind Say unto them O Muhammad O humankind I am the messenger of God unto all of you. Right? And so Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala then re-emphasizes the point there about belief in the revelations, belief in the last day, belief in the angels, belief in the previous revelations, Mm -hmm. but also belief in this revelation, and then also belief in all the prophets, but also belief in this prophet. 
Yeah, yeah. So, so, so those are what we would refer to as um, a religious pluralism and looking at it from theological perspectives and looking at it also from a sort of salvation perspective, right? And so uh, that is absolutely crystal clear. And that is not what we intend when we speak about religious pluralism and how we conduct ourselves accordingly in a, in a, in a pluralist society. Yeah, yeah. Right. So what we are referring to, and here's a text, and I'm going to share this text with you also, inshallah, for our discussion going forward. Uh, it's a wonderful text. Uh, it literally has the title which says, um, a thematic study of uh, a, 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 a Quranic thematic study of religious pluralism, right? But he calls it not religious pluralism. He says normative religious pluralism. So normative religious pluralism literally is in re uh, meant to, to, to relate to uh, the way in which we uh, conduct ourselves with the rest of humankind and people of other faiths. What the ethical foundations are, what the foundations are of human dignity, for example, mm. and so forth, when we interact with the other. And we take that firmly and squarely from the Quran, and we take it firmly and squarely from the uh, teachings and the conduct and actions of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So again, sort of uh, to, 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 to re-emphasize the point that our focus when we are and we'll be talking to the notion of religious pluralism will be about normative religious pluralism, what the uh, implications are in terms of how we conduct ourselves, uh, what the uh, values and the, and the foundational principles will be that inform our relations uh, with the other, our relations with people of other faiths, etc., etc. And so here I think it is important that we um, uh, begin to then uh, uh, revert to, 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 to some of those foundational values, Jihadija, and we have touched on those uh, quite a bit before and so forth. And uh, those are, of course, the notions of um, a compassion, mm. uh, a human, human dignity, dignity mm. uh, justice, uh, the notion of respect, compassion, uh, for the other, kindness, compassion, mm. and so forth. Right? So those would be the value set yeah. that informs everything that we do. So, so that's the, the pluralism part. Of course, the notion and Khadija of, of religion itself is also something which must be uh, clearly perhaps understood not only perhaps for a, a, a non-Muslim listener uh, or rather a Christian or a Jewish uh, listener of, of Radio 76, but sometimes for ourselves as well. And so when we talk about religion, um, there are different notions that are conjured up in the minds of people in, in history, yes. right? And so um, uh, they are certainly from a sort of Western perspective, what, what can be said to be understood by the term religion. And incidentally, when we do say Western, what we really mean is also Christian, for example, and so forth. And uh, fundamentally, that has to do with the idea of, um, you know, the relationship between man and God and how uh, uh, everything that relates to my relationship with God is what religion is all about, right? So it's kind of a vertical, um, uh, a sort of relational type of um, the description and uh, the definition. And uh, so, 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 so that's the extent to which it... In Christianity, there has been um, attempts, for example, as we know, at uh, bringing a measure of um, sort of almost cohesion amongst different denominations, but still within Christianity, right? And how they can begin to relate to one another. We know that at times in history, different um, uh, 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 denominations uh, uh, of, of Christianity fought wars and, and battles on the basis that those were Catholics and those were Protestants, for example. And so there's this movement of ecumenism uh, 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 that then began to say, how do we begin to cooperate and coexist and integrate uh, as society and as community despite our theological differences. But this was kind of within the house of, of, of Christianity. And then in, in a more sort of, sort of uh, 
more recent development in that sort of to to extend beyond the Christian community. This ecumenism had also begun then also to extend beyond the the house of of, of Christendom, and they also began to look at how, from an ethical perspective, uh, relations of interfaith and pluralism uh, is extended also to to people of other faiths other than Christians, right? And so. Uh, in this regard, we will of course understand that uh, yes, in the in the struggle days, we've seen how uh, Christian leaders, for example, and so from their perspective, uh, with their counter, uh, with their uh, co-religionist uh, cohorts like Muslims and uh, let's say Hindus and Jews, for example, um, had worked together on common values and mm. common principles uh, in order to achieve the common good for humankind and so forth. We've seen that. And so that then begins to extend what we essentially um, as Muslims believe to be at the core of our understanding of religion. Because for us, it's not only about our relationship with Allah, it's also equally a religion for us, <laughs> if this word religion can be used as a translation for the word deen. Mm. Because the word deen literally means, literally it means a way of life. Yeah. There are uh, sometimes sayings and sometimes uh, a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that um, uh, uh, abundantly clarify the notion that the word deen is a way of life in a literal uh, sort of translation of the word deen, right? Let alone any kind of technical um, uh, uh, addition to that. So, kamata deenu tudan, you hear the word deen in there, it's like an Arabic saying, as you live, mm. as you live, so your life shall be, right? And so, um, it's it's like, um, uh, uh, <laughs> and so that is an Arabic saying. So you hear the word deen in there very literally almost, even though it's a construction of a verb instead of this deen, which is a construction of a noun. But nonetheless, so uh, uh, when we then speak about our relationship with Allah, this is certainly a part of what deen, but our relationship with also our fellow human beings, right? Whether that is from within the house of Islam and outside the house of Islam, that is essentially also. So uh, there are some great philosophers and thinkers of our times who have beautiful um, and very, very eloquent articulations about this, like uh, Sayyid Al-Attas, who is this um, very famous Malaysian uh, philosopher who recently passed away and he reinforces and affirms this notion that um, you know it's about also how we live uh, as human beings and how we live with others as human beings and that's what and then there's a, a, a wonderful con uh, um, there's a wonderful articulation and conceptualization uh, similar to what uh, Sayyid al-Attas uh, has has also um, presented and this is by um, uh, the great Palestinian scholar and philosopher also, uh, Ismail Farouqi. So he has a, a magnum opus of his which is written uh, about the concept of Tawheed, for example. But Tawheed as, uh, uh, as a civilizational impulse. And so he says that um, the notion of Deen uh, is about the fundamental project of civilizational development, right? To develop civilization. So in this sense, therefore, um, given how the world has brought us all together in this global village and globalization with all its pros and cons that go with that and so forth, but the reality is, is that we've never ever as human society lived um, as integrated and as pluralist in terms of societies uh, to the degree that we are today. We are, um, uh, even in our own country, and certainly with migration in every other, uh, if you wish, major center or city in the world, you'll find this melting pot of cosmopolitanism, mm. cosmopolitan sort of, you know, um, uh, uh, integration of people. And so how do you, and so 
That's what civilizational uh, considerations, of course, uh, offer and proffer for humankind. And so we are saying that all the values of Islam, of the justice and of the compassion and of the dignity, human dignity and human rights and freedom and equality and all of those, is what is intended, this deen, is what is intended to be brought to bear in terms of uh, this development of human civilization. And I think, uh, Khadija, just maybe as a little side note, um, you know, when 7th of October has laid bare to the world the hypocrisy of Western civilization, right, and how uh, the notion of international law, which is supposedly, supposedly the structure or the construct wherein which um, the, the, the rules-based world is presented to humankind, that all of that is an absolute farce. Mm. And it only applies when, it, when, when as, as and in the context of the authors of those laws. Yes, of course. Of course. And only uh, the, uh, the global north. And it has absolutely zero, nothing to do with the global south. Yeah. Only to the extent that it is expedient and when it serves their purposes. Absolutely, and the reality is because it's a hegemonic narrative, it somehow it permeates our way of thinking. 100%. Uh, and it's designed to be like yes, that Yes, exactly, exactly. Sheikh is talking about th th this way of being. And so, yes, exactly, contrary to what it ought to be, yeah. where, where our natural fitra makes us hearken towards these universal values. Uh, that you that 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 we spoke about 100%. for me for me this this uh, this whole concept around religious plurality it takes us so beautifully back to our previous discussions exactly when we were talking about that because part of the danger of course and I would like Sheikh's comments on on this as well uh, part of the danger of course you speak about what it is not. Yes. So no, it's not relativism. Yes. This is not something subjective that I can say. And then again, in this particular liberal narrative, that's what it's about. You know, what where the human being is centralized and it's what the human being wants and what suits the needs of the human being. So that's the danger, of course, of, of it stepping in this. So you make it clear it's not that. Yes. Uh, it's not about salvation. It's not about exclusivism. Um, it's also not, of course, about the idea. This is what's implied in what Sheikh is saying, of, that we hearken or that we hone into the different differences. Yeah. Hence this um, uh, almost like this this condition right at the beginning that we're speaking about universal values for humankind, dignity, compassion, underpinned by justice, of course, yeah. everything underpinned, underpinned by justice. And very importantly, this this vertical uh, relationship between human and God. Yeah. So there's the, the, the exist, the transcendental is there. But one can't deny the horizontal because that's the innate nature of the human being as well. That we are social beings, that we are relational beings. We think back of about, about our previous discussions around being of benefit to society. We also think exactly around the danger of when it becomes something, we, 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 we speak about pluralism, but we are focused on the differences. And we think back about <clears throat> a book that was hugely impactful, a text which... Uh, worryingly so was usually impactful uh, the, the clash of civilizations yes. where Huntington speaks about this idea mm -hmm. you know where, where, where religion becomes a source of con conflict, conflict. Um, so so uh, when we speak about plurality and pluralism of course it is with what Sheikh is going to of course quote for yeah. us from this particular book where we speak about the fact that um, yes religion in and of itself and language is often restrictive Hence, we hearken back to what is innately human and these, these values. Yeah. So, so about that civilizational impulse and the civilizational sort of project of the Dean, you know, uh, is in fact uh, just to also l link it to some of the discourses more contemporarily, uh, contemporaneously, currently, about the higher purposes of the Dean, right? And so some of the very innovative kind of contributions by contemporary scholars about what constitutes the higher purposes of the Sharia. Uh, and then also with innovative type of approaches talking about not necessarily only what are the higher purposes of the Sharia, but also what are the higher purposes of the Quran mm. itself, right? And there's a a distinct um, a sort of trajectory uh, distinction in the trajectory between the two. 
the development of what is termed uh, by ourselves as the higher purposes of the Sharia on the one hand and the higher purposes of the Quran on yeah. the other. And these are complementary, certainly by all means, but they are two different trajectories also uh, of development. And so at the core of all of that, uh, the conclusion that is being drawn by our Ustad, um, Sheikh Taha Jabil Alwani, who then uh, brought our attention, and this is the direction where lots of research is going, our attention to a deep dive and a reversion to, 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 to explore the higher purposes of the Qur'an itself, is then to come to the conclusion that the building and the development of human civilization lies at its core. Yeah. You understand. And so how do we as, um, and again, linking it to 7th of October, and this has now become so exposed to the whole of humankind who mm -hmm. have their fitra intact, <laughs> their sound it's human nature intact, not uh, the others, uh, right? But for the whole of humankind, they have uh, 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 equally uh, uh, alongside ourselves, uh, being re, uh, you know, affirmed and confirmed about the um, the hypocrisy of of these structures and of these systems, and and the evil really of these structures and of these systems, and so the only option, of course, for humankind that is left, is Islamic civilization, the mm -hmm. Islamic civilizational mm -hmm. project, as it was during, and may Allah forgive us to, to only sort of, you know, as you say, harken back, but also nostalgically referencing back, as opposed to re-establishing um, uh, 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 what we had in what is referred to as the golden era and the brilliant age uh, in the history of Islam, when it was the center of human civilization for 800 years. And um, again, even in the context of 7th of October, it is the only time in history where uh, the Jewish people lived in such peace and security and harmony when they lived within the context of Islamic civilization. Unlike any other period in history, you understand? And th these are historical facts. Right, that are being affirmed uh, by Jewish historians themselves, and so I think, therefore, it behoves us to um, to reconnect with this notion of what religious pluralism means for us as 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 Muslims, and uh, placing again that emphasis on the uh, normative religious pluralism, which has intimate relevance to all of human beings intimate relevance to all of human beings, right? And so that doesn't, again, the point that we want to make, it doesn't only refer to our co-religionists, fellow Muslims, but all of humankind. Yes. Right, and, and Jagadija, I find myself sometimes feeling that this is being repetitive, <laughs> but there's this almost impelling um, sort of uh, feeling that one wants to, um, sort of hit this home because also of sometimes uh, contradictory uh, narratives that are out there that sometimes want to reinforce the notion that Islam is this exclusivist type of uh, you exactly. know way of life and, 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 and which is of course the greatest. Uh, injustice. Exactly. Can I can, can I done. can I just say the Sheikh? That's exactly the reason why I hearken uh, uh, back to our discussion, mm. our prior discussion. We drawing from the Sira of the Prophet Sallallahu We we you showed us what happened after the Hijra, and and the social contract, and no exclusivity, and nobody. I yeah, mean, yeah. no group of people was uh, was marginalized or put on the periphery, and and so so yes, absolute imperative that that Sheikh repeatedly make make that yeah. point. The other part that I quickly want to say is that this type of uh, this unity that we see even oftentimes within our own within Muslim discourse within, yeah. and and so this constant uh, uh, this constant emphasis on differences. Yeah. We cannot. I don't think we can overemphasize the point that it yeah. ought to be on the other extreme, as as yes. Sheikh is saying about unity, where we said this this unity often obscures yeah. what happens underneath the surface. Yeah, and and a Quranic approach to uh, reinforce your motivation is also sometimes we um, you know this 
mindset that we have of reducing people to certain biased tropes and yes. certain misconception and biased sort of ideas of what, for example, what are Jews? This is in history, right? So Allah in the Holy Quran makes it very clear that yes, and Allah speaks about how people of the book before have in fact uh, murdered sometimes prophets. But then Allah in the same context always makes the point to say, Laysu sawa'a. But they weren't all like that. Laysu mm. sawa'a. <laughs> Min ahlil kitab ummatun qa'imatun yatluna ayati Allahi ana al-layli wa hum yasjudun. They were also from amongst them devout uh, uh, observers and devotees of Allah, of the Ahlul Kitab. And so whilst they were from among those, you know, who were guilty of the kind of things which, of course, uh, brought about uh, sort of almost in a sense, um, you know, dest destiny type of impact on history, there were also others who were not like that. And so we don't reduce human beings only to almost like, um, you know, uh, uh, stroking everybody with the, with the same brush. Yeah. Uh, but what we do is we obviously identify the right and we identify the values and we identify where things are wrong and we do not necessarily highlight that in relation to human beings, yes. right? We, we highlight that it's like our scholars also would say is that you try and rectify the wrong, you try and eliminate the sin. But not the sinner, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. And so those are very important, I think, approaches which the Quran emphasizes and which the Prophet Sallallahu also emphasize. And so, but the Prophet Sallallahu and the Quran also emphasizes that your preoccupation with differences has natural consequences. Occupation with differences has natural consequences. If you are going to uh, continuously focus on polemics, that is who you will become. Mm -mm. You will become that. That's Allah's law. And so whilst there is the space and the room that our educational processes need to continue, in a, but when we are in spaces where we now need to be more mature because people have to live side by side with one another, there has to be peaceful coexistence. There has to be the dignity of every human being intact irrespective of his faith. And so at the core of this, again, to maybe just establish those values of religious pluralism as well in, in this context is about Allah's emphatic statement in the Quran that there's no compulsion. There's no, la ikraha fid deen. There's no compulsion uh, in the affairs of deen. And so that's an emphatic, absolute universal statement. And so um, in, 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 in living that, it means then that you've got to take that value and operationalize it. You've got to live it, even though, yes, we are confirmed and very clear that theologically we have differences. Yes. That does not mean that those differences that you have theologically is sanctioned or approved of in the Quran to lead to strife, to lead to civil strife, to lead to enmity and hatred. Mm. Because one is not defined because, through those differences. Precisely. And Allah has guaranteed you to have the freedom of conscience. conscience. And Allah has, of course, made it a fundamental principle also, the, again, of, of civilizational development. How do you develop civilization if you have to, like in the uh, age of the, uh, the Crusades, you have to fight one another because you have different religions? I, how, how do you go back to that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Even though I must say that, uh, so the Crusaders is no longer called the Crusaders, but imperialism is, is still Slowly. there. And so the same people who were those um, uh, Firing on all cylinders. Uh, all cylinders. Uh, colonialism, imperialism is still alive and kicking. Mm. Again, the emphasis on how, therefore, humankind is in such great need for an alternative. Yeah. The only alternative is Allah's final revelation. And also a great need, uh, Sheikh, and unfortunately we have to wrap up. Can you believe that we are out of time? We're going to have to get to the text next week, inshallah. But inshallah. also on what Sheikh is saying, really how imperative <clears throat> it is that we understand these concepts and what happened historically and how these concepts, as you say, they're not just concepts on paper. They are alive and well and it's happening. It's around us all the time. And why 
October the 7th happened and why genocides happened and the rest of the world, as you say, even though we are in the majority, those of us, that's still very much conscious of our essential fitra, why yes. this happens. And the, and those that go against human nature, human, y- y- human humanity, nature, yeah. they are in the minority. Yeah. But it's because we, we need to understand these concepts, absolutely. They are still in control of uh, the, the current form of civilization. They, yeah. they are the ones who are um, unfortunately wielding authority, wielding power, yeah. and we give it to them. Hence, as you mentioned, also these values that we talk about, which on paper sound, you know, it doesn't sound like the most difficult thing to do mm. when you speak also about north of religious pluralism. Ideally, that's how it ought to be, but it's not. But yes. we need to, yeah, we need to understand. Sheikh, always so enlightening. Shukran so much for sharing your thoughts and your insight with us this morning. We're looking forward to continuing uh, with that uh, next week, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Khadija, and to all the listeners.